My name is Tad Gallion, and I want to tell you about a mathematical discovery I've made about prime numbers. If you don't like equations, don't worry. You are in good company because prime numbers don't like equations either, and there will be none in this video. Prime numbers are simply the numbers with only two factors, one and themselves. So how do we find prime numbers if they don't like equations? People have sieved for primes for thousands of years. You start with two, the first prime, and you cross out all of its multiples. The second number, three, is not crossed out, so it's prime. If you cross out all of three's multiples, that leaves five, seven, and all the other primes up to 23. It's pretty simple, but labor-intensive, and sadly, there's no equation to make it any easier. Because it's labor-intensive to find very large primes, it makes them useful for cryptography, so they're used in everything from encrypting state secrets to making shadow currencies. And that makes them very important. So the slightest breakthroughs make headlines. When Yi Tang Sang found there were an infinite number of prime pairs bounded by no more than 70 million, headline news. A subtle non-random behavior in the last digits of primes is found, it's covered in the mainstream media. If a new large Mersenne prime is found, it's in the New York Times. Sometimes insights into primes come in unexpected ways. In 1963, Stanislaw Ulam while doodling during a dull lecture, wrote sequential numbers spiraling outward in a square grid, which revealed prime numbers' tendency to line up, a vague order in a seeming chaos. The rows suggested functions that returned prime-rich results. Ulam's spiral was born. I, too, started to doodle with numbers. However, I used different rules and produced something very different, something I believe is very significant. This is how it works. Let there be an equilateral triangle lattice, which we will fill with prime and composite numbers, letting two occupy the first cell. It has an orientation with a bottom, a left, and right side. We exit through the left side, and we place three in its cell. It, too, has a bottom, a left, and right side. If we continue to sequentially add numbers to cells, each exiting through their left sides, the number line will fill a six-cell hexagon and will continue to spin in a counterclockwise fashion around this axis forever. However, that's not what we do. We place integers sequentially in the lattice with a simple rule. Each time a prime number is encountered, the spin switches. I'll make the prime numbers red to highlight when the spin will switch. So, from the first cell, exit from two's left side, this sets the spin to left as we did in the prior example. However, the next cell is three, a prime. So unlike the earlier graphic, it does not continue to spin left. The spin switches to right. Four is not prime and continues right. Five is prime, so switch to left and so on. There are twists and turns until 19 abuts 2. Notice three little hexagons have formed that I call blue, red, and green, each filled in a clockwise fashion. Now, the number line begins to coil upon itself. 20 lands on 2 cell, 21 on 3 cell. Prime number 23 sends the number line to form a fourth hexagon, purple. Note this is filling in a counterclockwise spin. Twin primes 29 and 31 send the number line down to define a fifth hexagon, cyan, also counterclockwise. Finally, 37, a non-twin, reverses the rotation of the system so 47 can define the yellow hexagon, also with a counterclockwise spin. Surprisingly, after this, all numbers to infinity are confined to these 24 cells. There is no exit. The reason? No prime numbers occupy a cell with a right or left side on the hexagon's outer boundary. As you well know, aside from two, even numbers are never prime. If we fill every other cell on our hexagon, you will see where even numbers will land. These are never prime, so the path never switches direction here. Likewise, every third number is multiple of three. Those numbers are thrieven, if you'll tolerate the word, and are also never prime. If we start with three, we know it spins right. The next cell is even, so the number line continues right. The cell after that is not even, or thrieven, 
so it might be prime. If it is prime, it will send the path another way. If not, it will continue on, so we have to assess both directions. The next cell, in both directions, are divisible by 2 and 3, and not prime. Advancing on, we find cells that are not divisible by either 2 or 3, so maybe prime. We continue on. We fill the hexagon with even and threeven cells. Once the hexagon is fully filled with even and threeven cells, we know where the number line cannot switch directions. Notice three sides of the large hexagon are lined by even cells, and the other three sides are lined by threeven cells. So the number line never switches direction while on the outer edge of the hexagon, so the number line forever spirals within. And, just as interesting, primes can only land in these six cells. This finding is so remarkable I thought my work was done. However, I soon began to wonder about the small hexagons within the larger hexagon. What are they? Perhaps the rules that govern the number's spin has deep mathematical significance. I reasoned if the hexagons are significant, they must be associated with something else. And that something else will not look random in relation to spins. I decided the simplest test would be to look at sequences, find which color hexagon each sequence member lands in, and see if anything fishy was going on. It works like this. I have cataloged the color spin values for all numbers below 2.6 times 10 to the 16th power. 3 is blue, 2017 is green, 900,103 is red. Now, if I take a known logical sequence of numbers, say 10, 10 squared, 10 cubed, 10 to the fourth, and so on, and look at their spins in the hexagon, the resulting colors associated with each member should appear random, unless the sequence I'm investigating is linked to the nature of prime numbers. What I'd expect to see is the six possible spin colors to be assorted randomly, as if I'd tossed a handful of six-sided dice. If the powers of 10 all returned, say, with blue spin or sequential rainbow results, then I'd say the results were not random and therefore the prime numbers have a linkage to 10. If the colors do come back random, then I suspect 10 is not linked to prime numbers. I only looked for very obvious results, not subtle statistical variation, by visually screening the spin colors. However, I first needed to learn what random looks like. So I took random dice rolls and assigned each face a spin color. You will likely notice random looks very clumpy. I then took various well-known sequences such as Marison primes and typical sequences such as 2 and its powers and have assigned each member's value its corresponding spin color. I've screened dozens of sequences. Some grew so quickly I couldn't assign enough spin states to draw any firm conclusions, though their early values were very suggestive. Other data sets had lots of values, looked suggestive enough for future statistical analysis, but were not very obviously non-random. To date I have found only one number sequence that very obviously produces non-random results the sequence of pi and its powers, so pi, pi squared, and pi cubed. If you are like me, you might think these colors look perfectly random, except random is clumpy. Dice roll two in a row, dice roll three in a row. Adjacent colors of powers of pi do not land in the same hexagon. I can't say that they won't ever do so, but I have rolled the pi dice 34 times and it has not done so yet. The odds of this happening randomly is less than one in 400. This suggests the order and type of prime numbers is associated with the number pi.